Do you have your medical card? I do. And if you'd like to get yours, today's guest will be able to help you do just that. There's a few reasons you should consider getting your card, and it's not, I would say, primarily the cost savings that you receive at the counter because, you know, the prices are high and you definitely do get you do get some price savings with the medical card if you shop at a medical store. However, once again, the prices are are really high, so all you're missing out on is the taxes. With a medical card, you only pay 1% tax at retail stores that have a medical license. That's key. As of today, May 20th, 2024, there are 55 retail stores that are licensed to sell medical. So if you want to shop medical, you have to go to one of those stores. At least that is the case today. Uh, As we've covered in the past and present, there have been attempts to make it so that medical card holders can shop at every retail location uh, in the state that is licensed to sell at that medical tax rate. But as of today, it's only the 55 retail stores that were licensed to sell medical originally. Now, again, I want to say, and we'll cover this during the episode, there's more than that That's there's so much more than that uh, to getting a medical card. Uh, So many more reasons to consider getting your medical card. I'm having trouble with words right now because of the uh, stuff. But um, what I'm trying to say is the rights that the medical card affords you. It's this weird situation where, you know, uh, a relationship with a health professional basically grants you more rights. I'm not aware of a parallel or an analogy. Literally, if you get your medical card, you are allowed to grow five medical, uh, five plants for your own use uh, in your own house, which is pretty awesome. You can grow your very own plants, only five of them. Hopefully that number increases in the, in the future to an unlimited amount or at least a, a larger amount. Uh, I don't believe anything is legal if you can't do it without a card but in you know since you have the card it's crazy that you're limited at all um but that's the way that it is today on may 20th 2024 and as i've covered on the show in the past uh if you have a medical card at home at least with regard to the product that you cultivate you have no possession limit I've covered it briefly on the podcast in the past, but I wrote an article at length on the subject if you'd like to check it out. I'm displaying it on the screen right now. I'll also have it in the show notes. I believe we also discuss it during this episode. The whole reason I'm coming to you before this episode is to let you know that Modern Compassionate Care, our guest Katie, is running a summer special on medical card certifications. Book now at moderncompassionatecare.com. And that's June through August, and you can get a pretty cheap certification. Looks like less than $100. So check that out. Go to moderncompassionatecare.com and enjoy this episode of The Cole Memo. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is The Cole Memo. I'm your host, Cole Preston. Every episode is released in audio, video, and transcript format. To find the transcript, audio, or video version of any episode, please refer to the description of the episode that you're listening to now. Within that description, you can find a link that will take you to our website, which will display the transcript for this episode and the platforms where you can find this episode in audio or video formats. If you're unable to locate the episode description on whichever platform you're listening from, I get it. 
The platforms change all the time. Simply take note of the episode number and visit thecolememo.com. From there, you can use our search functionality to find the corresponding episode, and then you'll be able to access the audio, video, and transcript version of that episode. You might also find any links that we reference during this episode so that you might be able to get your own medical cannabis card from Modern Compassionate Care, for example. We'll also have any links that we reference uh, in the episode so that you can do your own research. If you're not listening to this episode of The Cole Memo on Patreon, then you're listening to this episode a little bit later than our patrons. To become a patron, go to thecolememo.com slash Patreon. It's a great way to support our show. It gets you instant access to our episodes as they release. Another way to support our show is at thecolememo.com slash support. You can make a one-time, monthly, or yearly contribution of your choice. Shout out to Tom G for giving us a contribution. Our show is funded by listeners like you. Uh, But I just want to say that one of the best ways to support our show is absolutely free. Just subscribe or follow the show. Leave a positive review from wherever you're listening to us from. Favorite this episode. Share it with your friends. Your engagement and support is appreciated. Today is May 14th, 2024. Katie, we are blowing through 2024. How are you doing today? I am excellent. I'm so happy to be here with you. Um, I was going to be like, it's been a long week, but um, it's Tuesday. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Easy with that. You're going to jinx happened us in the past couple of days. You're going to jinx us to an even longer week. <laughs> um, I'm uh, displaying your website right now. I want to give you the space. I mean, I kind of plugged it in the intro. You can get your medical cannabis card from moderncompassionatecare.com. Schedule your appointment now. Um, But yeah, I want to give you the space. Tell us who you are, what you do, all that stuff. Awesome. Thank you, Cole. So I'm Katie Sullivan. Um, I'm a family nurse practitioner um, and I'm co-founder of Modern Compassionate Care, the um, clinic that Cole just showed you the website. So Modern Compassionate Care, we do medical cannabis care, kind of comprehensive. We do medical cards for people. Um, We help people out, um, you know, people that have kind of complex chronic conditions to, to help optimize their cannabis regimen. Um, or, you know, for people who are new to cannabis, cannabis naive, uh, maybe your grandparents who, um, you know, um, need some guidance, um, are a little wary of going into the dispensary. So we kind of, our, our clients run the gamut, um, when it comes to medical cannabis and we work with kids and adults. Um, and then we also offer mental health counseling, and ketamine assisted psychotherapy. And we've been doing um, the ketamine assisted psychotherapy since, um, well, a little, about a year, a year and a half at this point. Um, and that's been a great journey too. You know, we uh, we have a small group of clients that we work with, but um, we've seen such good results with that. So that's, that's kind of the other service that we offer now. And, you know, that is like in conjunction with, you know, you get medication, we do um, oral medication for ketamine, or we do intramuscular in our office. Um, And you have the support of trained psychedelic assisted therapy providers that are also psychologists. So um, yeah, it's, it's cool. Setting up that program has been great. So that's what we do at Modern Compassionate Care. Um, You know, I'm, I'm passionate about this. Uh, We started this business like four years ago, almost, we started conceiving it. Um, we've been seeing a lot of patients. You know, I think I've certified pushing on 2000 people here in the state of Illinois. Um, and I'm so proud to do that because, uh, the lack of access to this type of healthcare is the reason I started this. There's really so few people doing it and providing it. And we know we have a lot of people using cannabis, you know, and, we have so many registered patients, but we have a lot more people that are cannabis consumers, you know? So, uh, that was kind of my goal starting out. This was filling that gap in care. And I'm also a member of the Illinois department of public health medical cannabis advisory board. Um, so that's the, the body that votes on, uh, approving new conditions in the state of Illinois that would be eligible for getting the medical card. And, Uh, We just had our, was that our second meeting ever? Yep. Yeah. Our second meeting ever yesterday. Yeah. And I guess, (laughs) I guess just for a quick background for folks, I'll pull up our document here. Um, It it, it won't be the, I guess it, it would be your second meeting ever, right? 
Uh, yes, that's true. That this is the second iteration of the Medical Cannabis Advisory Board. Right. So the, the new board that's just formed our second meeting. Yeah. 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 And so thank you for that. Uh, the reason I brought that up, I always like to bring up our history. And so for folks that are wondering, first of all, you can download this document that I'm about to display at thecolememo.com slash history. But yeah, in the past, um, the Medical Cannabis Advisory Board had um, you know, successfully, um, pushed PTSD and 11 other, sorry, 10 other ailments. This was in 2015. Actually, sorry, I should correct myself. They, they formally pushed to add those new ailments, but that was denied, um, in, on September 10th, 2015. So there's a rich history to this medical cannabis advisory board, yeah, um, I believe that they got PTSD and maybe a couple, a few other conditions pushed through and on the condition that the Medical Cannabis Advisory Board disbanded. Yes. Um, so in order to do that, the board member said, fine, we think it's really important that we have these things on there. But then that Medical Cannabis Advisory Board was dissolved. And that was like, you know, written into the original, you know, like law that 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 needs to be in place. So there were several years that it wasn't. And even forming this board, I mean, I was interviewed in 2022. So it's been taking them a long time to kind of roll this out. But we, you know, we, it feels like we're, you know, we, we were trying to plug ahead, but you know, it's, this is a new experience for me dealing with bureaucracy or like how things work in the government in this way. And it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah. It's different. You know, it's just, it's um because, you know, I come from the background of advocacy and like direct patient care being in the lawmaking space and seeing like, who's in charge of this? How are they, how is this process being carried out? It's a learning, it's a, you know, learning experience for me and um you know, an honor to serve on the board, but definitely interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say a lot of learning is going on, like, yeah. you know, like you say, not only from your perspective, but even from, you know, somebody like me who's just watching, you know, from the sidelines. So it's very interesting to see how it all works. And I just wanted to say, Katie, before we got into uh, the the body of our show, if you will, that um, thank you for doing what you do uh, for the community. Seriously, you know, um, getting people the access to to the plant and, and the other things that you mentioned that you do. Seriously, thank you for uh, being compassionate and trying to take care of our community. I love you for saying that. Thank you, Cole. You know, like yeah. that's, you know, it comes from, for me, a personal place. Um, I want to help people get access to this and have better options, safer options for pain control, you know, for their mental health. So I appreciate that so much. And like, likewise, back to you, you know, much how much I respect the work that you're doing to really bring this process out into the open, because it has not really been transparent. And um, you've created quite a record of what has been happening here with cannabis legalization in Illinois from the beginning. And I'm so glad you have like, this is, <laughs> I hope something, you know, like this, like should be a full um, college course or <laughs> an exhibition somewhere, a film festival of all your podcasts. I mean, that would really, that would really teach. And I, when I lecture at universities. Sometimes I was just at UIC a couple of times and I always shout out your podcast. Cause it's like, okay, if you want to learn more about the policy of this or why some of this stuff is happening, cause I like to talk about the social justice issues yeah. involved in this and the equity issues and the health equity issues. And so, you know, as a nurse, it's, it's our job to look at the situation, what's happening here, the political situation, how that's impacting our, the people that we are tasked to care for. And so, you know, like I want to get more nurses understanding, you know, like we've been the pioneers in advocating for patient use of this from the very beginning cannabis nursing is now a specialty and you know like we we need to we are the perfect people to know more about this and also to help advocate to our lawmakers to have the patients in mind because right now business has the in this is set up to be a you know commercial success and a tax you know win for the state mm -hmm. but medical patients um don't quite have that voice 
anymore. Maybe at first, you know, when the program started and it was just medical, but we need to keep doing this. And I think having medical professionals stand forward and speak to our lawmakers is really um, something that can help change their mind when they hear from providers and of course, patients. Yeah. Like that goes without saying. So rant over, but yeah. Yeah. And I, <laughs> uh, one last thing I wanted to say, just because I feel we both put in some real work on this. I can't, I got to give you more credit though. You fucking killed this list that, that people can ultimately download on episode 248 of this little show called the Chillinois podcast. You appeared um, and you went through this list, which like I say, you can see right there, folks, you can download it. Um, we talk about all the issues that we believe, and there's a lot, and I think these issues are still valid and, and longstanding at this point um, that the medical cannabis patients and caregivers face. So folks, uh, take the time to watch episode 248. I'll have it linked in the podcast description and you killed it uh, on that Um I mean, this is like totally, I got to revisit it again because we are collecting, you know, that information, like those of us who are advocating in this space to try to get that list on paper, you know, I'd like to see the Medical Cannabis Advisory Board be able to advocate officially for some of these things as, you know, one of the entities. But um, right now our role is limited, although I did get a little hope by the intro speech that that... (laughs) that the um, department gave at the beginning, like about the role of the board, but nothing specific was said, but I'd like to see some expanded opportunity for us to be able to advocate for medical patients through, you know, I mean, who knows what it could do, but pass it up the chain, an official letter, you know, we do believe these things could make this more safe and effective. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. And, you know, as you just as you mentioned earlier, we attended uh, it was the second medical since the advisory board has come back. We just attended the second medical cannabis advisory board meeting of which you're a member of. And I guess, you know, I've got some thoughts to recap it, but I, I wanted to give you the space Um either to set the stage or just to dive right into recaps. Maybe, maybe it is better to set the stage to like kind of let people know that don't even know what this is we're talking about. Maybe you can do that and say like what, what you understand the role to be and everything. And then we can go into our recap. Does that sound good? Yes, totally. So, so the medical cannabis advisory board is composed of now, I don't know exactly how many members, 13, 15 right now. Um, and we we are people that are appointed by the governor, ultimately, um, who, you know, I, I was approached, I was recommended by somebody who knew of the work that I did, interviewed um, about it, and then eventually you get appointed by the governor to serve on this board, um, and it's for like a term of two, two or three years, again, totally forgot I should know that, Uh, but I committed to it. I'm ready for this. So um, what, so you serve on the board and what the board does right now, the main role is to approve new condition, qualifying conditions to get a medical card in the state of Illinois. Um, The people that are on the board range from like, they have like doctors of all different specialties. Um, They have a couple on, or I think a nurse practitioner, like me, maybe two, two of us or a nurse practitioner and a nurse, I'm going to come in with the assist. I just found an official yeah. list that'll make this Perfect. a little bit easier on us. Uh, to your point, <laughs> 16 members. I was like, damn, that's, this is hard to probably give background on. 16 there members. Here's the composition. We don't have to go. I mean, if you'd like to go through them, but there's the composition um, of the board. You know, how many of each member you get. Um, mm-hmm. And like you said, they shall convene to examine debilitating conditions or diseases that would benefit the medical use of cannabis, review new medical and scientific evidence pertaining to the currently approved conditions, and the board shall issue an annual report of its activities each year. Yeah. So, um, you know, kind of a simple purpose right now, we do have so many conditions in the state of Illinois, but there's so many more that could be added on there. So um, I do think that's an important and, you know, primary role for us to have. But like I mentioned, we um, we would also like to be able to advocate for some of these other issues affecting medical patients because they, they don't really have, you know, a, a, anyone in their corner 
within the government, so to speak. I mean, I don't want to say like the division of medical cannabis doesn't care, but they can't really, you know, we're medical providers. So we do know what some of these other issues that we talked about on that last podcast. So, um, you know, that's something I know that we're hoping to bring up in the next meeting. So yeah, that's, that's the purpose of the board. Nice. And we we just got right back into these debilitating conditions. I mean, like I was glad to see that we launched right in to start adding new ones. Um, but you can see, you know, there's a ton. I mean, some very specific disorders like Sjogren's um, syndrome, but then, you know, chronic pains on there. Um, you know, the most common ones are PTSD, migraine, chronic pain, IBS, um, you know, uh, neuropathy, arthritis, osteoarthritis, and any of these things, you know, there's, we've got a lot of things on here. Um, I think more than people realize we have one of the States that have a more extensive list. Hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. But, you know, and so now we, um, you know, it was really nice to be able to review these women's health conditions that are being added now. Um, you know, and I, I'm really pleased that with the outcome of the meeting, but. Yeah. So for, did I get this right? There were three votes. One of them was a revote uh, because of the, the process, but three votes went through for three different conditions. Am I right on that? Or Actually, sorry to... yes, I believe you're right. It was. Um, it was. Three went through, one did not go through. So we voted on four conditions. Um, we voted on female orgasmus, orgasmic dysfunction, which we had like such a good guest speaker, um, Dr. Molda Hill, who spoke at the last meeting. So her research was so compelling that passed no problem unanimously. Uh, we voted on endometriosis, which passed. And then when we got to ovarian cysts, that's where there was a little bit of debate and we ended up doing that vote twice. Both times it passed with a yes, but more of the providers were comfortable adding painful ovarian cysts as the condition because, um, you know, we don't have any evidence that cannabis will shrink an ovarian cyst. Um, at this point, there was some concern raised because cannabis can increase estrogen levels to potentially worsen a cyst. That again is um, nothing proven, just a potential speculation, um, something to think about. But, uh, you know, I I spoke about a person like that. My health condition I'm dealing with right now is a giant ovarian cyst. And I said that in the meeting and told everyone like, you know, um, it's been difficult to get pain medication for this or a pain plan, which I, I like, even, you know, I'm like, I would like a non-opioid, like something to get me through till the right. surgery. Women's pain so often historically dismissed. Um, I see so many women as a cannabis clinician coming in because they're being told, okay, just take Advil, take Advil. And it's not really helping. And so I already knew try a cannabis suppository. You know, when this started happening to me, I already, I was, I had the benefit of having worked with so many other patients who had gotten relief from different forms of cannabis, you know, and I, I use it all topicals, inhaled, um, RSO, if my pain's really bad and the suppositories, which are like really hard to find, but for some people, um, that's going to be a huge, a huge relief, a, a very like helpful way to relax the muscles in that area. So I was kind of passionate, like I want this to pass. And I know, you know, my uh, friends from normal um, who were there, um, Felicia and Ari have been advocating for this. Chicago normal are the ones that filed the women's health conditions peti petitions. Right. Um, you know, and Chicago normal is a organization that I'm a member of and, you know, like love and support for the work they're doing. So this was really important for them. And they spoke up very well last me in, in the last meeting and in this meeting strongly on behalf of, you know, like the, the, the true reality that there's a lot of women suffering in pain from these conditions that could benefit from cannabis and already are using it. But if it, they're, it's not an approved condition, they're just paying more to the state. I mean, so uh, I was, you know, proud of them both times and their petitions were good. Um, you know, like that, 
made me happy. So I think what's going to end up happening with that one is it's probably going to say painful ovarian cyst. Um, you know, and there was some debate, like some, someone mentioned putting like severe, severe pain for ovarian cysts. And I'm like, you know, I, I'm not comfortable with adding a qualifier like that of to who's to judge. You know, if I'm having mild pain and I have an ovarian cyst and I want to utilize cannabis instead of a handful of Advil, because right. that helps my pain. And and I, one, as a provider, I'm okay with that. I know a lot of other ones would say, no, 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 do this, yeah. do that, the other thing. But, you know, to be honest, it's, it's an option for people that's safer than a lot of what's being offered to them. And, and there's people that don't tolerate certain medications well. Uh, and it's, it's, it's legal for recreational use. So, you know, right. why, why gatekeep? And, you know, there was a point in the meeting, which, you know, no shade on my one colleague, but, you know, she very clearly stated that she sees her role as gatekeeper. Right. To, you know, and I was like, wow, because I see myself as someone who facilitates access. Yeah, so I, 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 yeah, right. Like, you know, like, especially there's there, and I don't know what state it is, or if there's more than one, I don't know if you know this poll, but it's like, there's a few that are like at the discretion of the provider. They don't have a list. Yeah. of conditions. Just if the provider thinks it could be a good idea, they're working with a provider on it, you know? And uh, one of the big problems is we dropped the ball. We haven't trained any providers. There's so few people that can provide this care, but it's not hard. It's not, like it's going to take you a million years to learn about cannabis. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the same physiology stuff that we've studied. It's just a new system that you don't know about. And it's super interesting once you start learning about it. So, um, you know, and I, and like I said, I've been, I've been speaking at my alma mater and other universities to, you know, nursing students about the endocannabinoid system and people are totally interested you know, I'm, I'm, let's spread the gospel. We need more people. That's the problem. You know, if there there's, these people aren't getting support and then there's this gatekeeping going on where it's like, well, we don't know what you're going to do with it. Well, it's sort of like, well, are you providing support? Like at my clinic, we, we have a cannabis informed mental health provider right there. Right. Somebody that, you know, if, if, if you're having those kind of issues, you know, like we're, we're ready to work with your medical team, but you know, but why shouldn't somebody have the right to try this as an option just because there haven't been a ton of randomized controlled trials done? And the ones that have been done aren't, you know, like you kind of really look at some of these things, you know, they're either looking at like high dose use, like, oh, yeah, you know, it like where people are, you know, just getting high or they just don't have any idea what they're doing versus like, we're trying a low dose, we're trying a more therapeutic approach, we're trying a full spectrum approach, that stuff doesn't exist. But there's a reason they blocked the ability for us to do research. And so the anecdotal evidence is, is important. And listening to patients about what's helping them is important. Right. You know, like, that's how I feel. Right. Well, well said. I just had to let you go with that because it's just Sorry. like... <laughs> no, no, you. I couldn't have said it better than myself. I wanted you to, when you stopped, I was like, I, I wanted you to keep going. I mean, seriously, because um, there's just so many different things that you said. I took, I took notes on this. And I guess before we get to the other things, I wanted to just make it clear for folks that maybe got really excited when you said that those, those important conditions did get approved yes. uh, by the board. That's just by the board. Sh we should clarify that totally. there's something else that happens, right? And sorry to pop quiz you, but yes, no, that's a good point. So, like after it gets approved by the board, so and this process has changed. I think before it was the board went like directly to the governor, and the yeah. governor would sign off. Now they've changed it so that we're giving this to the head of IDPH, which again, I, his name is escaping my mind, but the 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 doctor who is heading up the Department of Public Health is the one that will choose or, or say these are the final ones and then give to the governor for approval. So um, so these are our recommendations. So we approved right. our recommendations. It hasn't been added as a condition yet. You know, stay tuned. And when they are, I'm sure, you know, we're going to be announcing it all over social media. You're going to be announcing it all over social media. So, um, 
you know, we'll keep people posted on that, but um, there's a still a process and Cole, I don't know how long it might take. That's another question that we didn't ask. So note to self over here. <laughs> note to self. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things you, you brought up is, is uh, just brilliant. And I wanted to say it again, I'm not trying to, um, talk negatively about anybody but the statement of gatekeeping did stand out to me and this idea that i i couldn't help but wonder why the insistence on limiting this at all like you said with adult use cannabis being so widespread i hesitate to say legal um but uh yeah i didn't know like i'm wondering if the insistence yeah. on keeping the list of qualifying conditions limited is a feature of cannabis 2.0 because we have to remind ourselves and by the way you mentioned something earlier about uh, how my podcast is coming together and it's weird how it snowballed into me creating like kind of a mini documentary, <laughs> you know? Um, so stay tuned for that. I'll give you Katie a sneak peek at that if you're interested um, still in, in the works, but this system that we created, which is the adult use system I'm referring to was modeled after the medical cannabis program, which a lot of these cannabis CEOs credit as birthing cannabis 2.0, which is my, the way I can say it without throwing up. Uh, the other <laughs> way people say it is prohibition 2.0. We'll say yeah. that for another uh, episode, but cannabis 2.0, what does that mean? Highly regulated, limited license, compliance based cannabis. Right. And I'm just wondering, yeah. because it, I've always focused on the limitations of licenses, but that what you brought up earlier is I'm wondering, is in, is the insistence to keep the list of qualifying conditions limited to the, you know, limited also a part of cannabis 2.0, as you pointed out, California, I did do some research on California, at least, because I know that they're one of the states that does this. The law broad uh, allows for broad discretion to recommend medical cannabis. Yeah. This started in 1996, uh, but was reaffirmed in 2003 and 2016. These laws maintain a broad interpretation, allowing doctors to recommend cannabis for any ailment for which they believe it could provide relief. This broad criterion makes cannabis, uh, California one of the more flexible states regarding medical cannabis usage. And I guess just to round out this point, and I'm curious what you think about this, there was a lot of scrutiny on the conditions. And, and I want to say that I totally get, you know, trying to approach this with protocol or formality, if you will, for lack of better words. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not like you, the board members, are giving anybody access. It still is between the physician and the patient, and it's not a prescription. It's a recommendation, and it's even like a timed one. I, I'm sure you know you know this. You have to have this bona fide relationship with the patient. So yeah, if the condition worsens, you know it's a conversation you can have, uh, and you, it's like the law still allows you know the physician to have some sort of power over that, just like anything else. So I guess I know I went a lot of different ways with that, but it just seems like almost like this idea of gatekeeping um, is almost futile, especially like you say, when you bring up that adult use cannabis is so widespread, it's like, okay, so your physician says no, but you still go get it. Yeah. That doesn't really happen with any other drug. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? Right. And this time you're doing it without professional guidance and support. So it's, it doesn't make any sense. And, you know, and, and someone like that, you know, there's a lot of people, the cost is really high. You know, it's, it's, um, I, I think there's a lot of still buzz in the media, you know, or worry and concern about cannabis use disorder. Um, you know, to me, cannabis use disorder is like a sign that like, you know, what there another intervention needs to, to happen. What's look underneath here speak, you know, there's, there's ways to really um, help people repair their relationship with cannabis and have a better effect and work on some of the root cause things that might be causing you to want to, um, you know, dissociate chronically, you know, if in that way, if, you know, if, if it's a burden on your life, but it's not something that is, um, you know, it's, I really see it as a, as a symptom of like trauma or PTSD or, you know, untreated underlying conditions or under treated under 
underlying conditions. Um, and so I, that's been one thing I've been just hearing a lot more about or worry about. And it's not that it shouldn't be um, thought of, but even the the tests that we use, like the you know questionnaire that we use to assess for cannabis use disorder, some of those questions in there include like, you know, do you use it daily? Um, does the thought of not being able to get cannabis um, distress you? A question like that. Well, you know, if you're if you're a medical patient who's dependently need you know needing this for pain control, for controlling spasticity, for you know managing cancer symptoms, well, you would be answering yes to both of those questions, and that doesn't mean you have cannabis use disorder, but you're scoring higher on that um, assessment because of that. So, you know, some of the statistics out there I think are skewed because the 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 battery of tests that they're using is is catching maybe medical patients and calling it cannabis use disorder. Um, or even yeah. just a physician that hears I use cannabis every day is like, well, well that's bad. And it's like, okay, well, do you know, I have like lupus and this is managed, you know, who just, you know, who knows? I, a lot of times I feel that um, disclosing to the wrong provider can really d negatively impact your care within the medical system still. So I'm rambling again now too, but I think that like th we have so much work to do around making, making this work for patients, you know, making this work for people that are trying to feel well and not be reliant potentially on pharmaceuticals that are giving them side effects or, or have addictive qualities that they don't want to deal with. And like, that is, that's, that's what I wish the medical cannabis advisory board was like, that I wish that everyone's mentality was that. And I know like no hate on the, the, my colleague, Dr. Nichols, who made that comment about feeling her role was being a gatekeeper. I, I believe that she works in like addiction medicine and rehabilitation. So like she, she has seen, you know, that's what she sees, you know, more than the general, you know, more than a lot of the providers that are on this this panel, you know, more so than me, she's seeing people that are having, you know, potentially like active addiction. And so she's a little bit more concerned about making this widely available. But again, it is widely available. It's it's of it's this is just allowing people to get a medical card and like some medical advice around utilizing cannabis. So it's a, a safer option. Right. Right. Like, right. Um, right. Cause it, it's legal. It's legal to get like most of the people that come see me are not like, it's my first time I've never used it. They're like, I've been going to the dispensary and this is really helping me. How do I get a medical card? Right. You know, like it's people are trying it for themselves, which is totally fine. That's how it's been always. You know, <laughs> Yeah. Like, the person that's asking for a medical card isn't like they didn't just try it last week. Right. I mean, you know, it, that, that's such a small, that's such a small portion of it. It's typically, you know, kids and really older people that I see um, with that. But, you know, there's more and more people coming to me saying my doctor recommended I get a medical card, but, they, you know, he or she can't sign for it. Hmm. Um, so is there like, still, you. I'm just curious, is there still like kind of hesitation or is it, or is it mostly I've heard like sometimes if you work under like a bigger org, they won't let you sign for it. So they have to like push to somebody like you or what did you mean? By yeah. That? Well, because it's schedule one still. Mm, and so I yeah. wonder if it becomes schedule three, but you know, like that's a whole nother thing because it's okay. like the products at the dispensary or like is, I, I don't, I don't think it's going to be they're not going to approve cannabis, a ever, you know, a compound that has a unique amount of cannabinoids each time it's grown is it's is, is slightly different versus what they're going to want to do, which is to isolate and make different forms of compounds and put them in a, in a pharmaceutical type deliverable. And those will be the things that are FDA approved right. schedule three cannabis medications. And they and will be prescriptions, not recommendations yes. right which is the a huge yes. difference can you briefly can you briefly unpack what you know like 
I don't mean to say what. So right now, like my, my medical cannabis certification that I write for someone is just me recommending. And that's all I can be. I recommend this person to the, to be able to get a medical cannabis card, you know, because they have one of these qualifying conditions, which I believe this could be helpful. Yeah. And so that's, that's all I can do. The prescription is like when I'm going to write a prescription for something else for somebody, you know, if I'm writing you an antibiotic, I'm giving the exact amount, the dose, it's going to a pharmacy being distributed to you in a, you know, pill form, or maybe, you know, what, you know, who knows, they might have, you know, topicals, they might have created some way to create a nasal spray. Yeah. Uh, but it's going to not be like full spectrum cannabis from the plant. And um, that's the thing that it's like, I want to see, we need to push for descheduling. That plant should be available for people who want to use that, like utilize the true form of the plant or make their own compound, you know, their own extracts, their own, topicals they want full control over the product that they're ingesting that's that's good you know more people should have that ability um you know i don't have to tell you that you know how i feel about some of the products that have been (laughs) sold in dispensaries Mm -hmm. but um so a prescription is going to be like a prescription like i put it into the computer i mean it might be good that's going to be covered by insurance yeah but the other thing is it's like it's it's highly controlled by me, the provider. I'm going to tell you exactly what to take. Right. right now, cannabis is something that, you know, it's it's a beautiful thing to teach people about utilizing it in a way that's fluid with their needs to support them the best way that they want for that. You know, what what's going on with you today? Like, you know, for so many, really for everyone, but, you know, chronic conditions are very ebb and flow sometimes. So to have the ability to really manage that yourself versus getting a pill and what we've seen even with the, the available FDA approved medications, you know, um, Epidiolex, I mean, that's been shown that's CBD. It is made from actual CBD. It's not a synthetic. It's a medication that's approved for use in two childhood epilepsy syndromes. And, um, you know, that, and then we have, um, like things like Marinol or Nabilone. Those are synthetic THC compounds given to patients for chemo induced nausea and vomiting compared to full spectrum THC, like THC from the plant with the other terpenes and the other cannabinoids mixed in with it. The therapeutic window, um, is narrower for those pharmaceutical drugs. They have more side effects and people report them being less effective. So that's what you might get um, with this schedule three. And, you know, yeah. as it like, I, I had like a bit of an outburst during the um, meeting yesterday, because one of the other doctors had kind of brought up, well, cannabis was in schedule one, like a very dangerous drug. Now it's in schedule three, like with ketamine and with you know, Tylenol with codeine and with anabolic steroids. So, you know, it's not, it's not a safe drug. And it's like, wait a minute, you're utilizing this classification by the DA, which is also incorrect. It's saying that cannabis is more dangerous than benzodiazepines like Xanax or Valium. That's not true. These things have a higher risk potential for overdose, death, very severe withdrawal and addiction. Come on, you know, and, and it would be classified higher than that. I think it needs to be descheduled, but I couldn't stop myself because he was using that as a reason to say that it's, it's cannabis is more dangerous than it really is. And it's like, I, I had to say something and they, in the chat, they were like, please don't speak out of turn. I was like, oh my God, I broke decorum. I'm a horrible board member. So apologies for that. But I so feel strongly that like those classifications and leaning back on those when they're so um, off base. And we know that, I mean, the schedule one, that's been so ridiculous when the government was carrying patents on like certain medical properties of the plant and they're saying it has no medical use for years. So, you know, like the, this, this schedule three, I mean, everyone's saying a step in the right direction. And I guess, that is correct. Like, 
if it becomes pills that are covered by insurance, it's going to allow a lot of more people to afford it. Um, I'm not saying that those medications that are made are going to be bad. Maybe they'll find a way to create it in a bioavailable form that's amazing that's FDA approved. Um, I'm not, you know, I don't really trust big pharma to take over cannabis. That just seems like the worst possible thing that could happen. Um, but, you know, if it's going to open up doors for research, if it's going to make it a little bit easier for businesses to do business, I hope that means all businesses, including small businesses, that's all good. You know, is it going to stop criminalization? It is not. Right. Schedule three, if you get caught with cannabis and you're in a non-medical state, you, you know, and even, I mean, could it be that if you're caught with a cannabis plant instead of a bottle of pills that you're going to be arrested. Like, what does that mean? Right. You know, part of all of the work we're doing with this needs to be ending the drug war. And this is not how you do it. Continuing to allow for criminalization and putting it in a category that's going to continue that practice to me is like, we have to push back against that because that's the problem. Right. It needs to be decriminalized. People should not be in jail for this. When these corps are making billions, you know, like straight up ranting, a ranting. No. At you. <laughs> hey, it's okay. This, this was also meant to be a therapy session. Now I'm Thank joking. You. Uh, but it is though for both of us. I will pay you after this 100% <laughs> for this therapy session. Um, to your but, point. Yeah. I had yeah. noted. Yeah. That, that an individual had said something to the effect of cannabis is not safe. And I, you know what? I want to be clear that I don't completely disagree with that statement, but I don't think anybody's yeah. saying that it's completely safe. What is completely safe? You can drink too much water. Like, right. You can, you know? So it's like, let's just be clear here. And, you know, um, like you say, I don't believe it should be scheduled at all. Like, if we're really talking about this, like, it's like alcohol and tobacco are not scheduled. And I know that nobody's claiming that like broadly that those substances have medicinal use, but I actually do believe that alcohol ha has some medicinal use, you know, like it's in NyQuil. It's the, you know, like it's in mouthwash. Like yeah. I know you don't right. drink it that way, but I'm just saying there's a lot of different. Yeah. And, and sometimes when I have a cold or a flu, I might just take a shot of whiskey, the old fashioned way, you know, right. just before bed, you know, hey, though, that's both true. 100%. Yeah. So, you know, I know that that's not in wide practice anymore, but I, I think it's, you know, a fair, like analogy to draw. So I, it's, it just feels like this is motivated only by like business interests or like, you know, this is like everything comes out and it's like, Oh, what's behind it. Somebody ready to make the money, you know? And it's, yeah. of course, I mean, I guess that's just the way things are, but one thing that I thought uh, that in public comment from Ari and uh, maybe maybe um, Alicia said something. Um, the one of the main points that I thought that was really great was the idea that kind of like agnostic of the condition isn't more data better, right? Like if we're like collecting why people are using cannabis and that is a conversation with their doctor and they're collecting that data, like. You get to draw from that. Totally. And I mean, oh, I, right. I wish point. the D division of medical cannabis was doing more than just that. But yes, they're the more specific. I believe that too. The more specific on there or, you know, like if somebody has multiple conditions, I list every single one of those conditions. Yeah. And, you know, like because, you know, like, yeah, that's that's what's accurate. And the more accurate we can be, you know, the chronic pain on the one hand is um, great because it allows a lot of people to utilize it. But it's like, what kind of chronic pain? You know, like we do have neuropathy, nerve pain on there. But, you know, what location, where, like, you know, who, <laughs> who you know, we'll know who's, you know, it, what is the gender? What is the age of the person that is experiencing this? Um, and they have the access to the patient database. I mean, there. I wish there could be a voluntary survey study done of the patients like that could be anonymous for them that the state would undertake to find out like, 
is this helping you or how is this working for you? Like where patients could easily give feedback. I, That's a and, solid idea. You know, I, I like that. I mean, it seems like something that it's like, I guess worth proposing or talking about. I mean, they're the ones that have everyone's information. Right. You could put it right in the patient portal and be like, there's something we need you to fill out. Ding and just have them answer, right? Oh, well, I guess that doesn't make it anonymous though. But there's ways. There's gotta be ways. Yeah. You know? Um totally. I think that that's something that we all should receive yeah. the email just like we recently did, albeit everybody gets it at a different time. But hey, it is what it is. It's the best we can do uh, about the new portal that's potentially coming. You know, everybody receives yes. an email. So who's to say they can't, like you say, send a survey of sorts that's that's voluntary and anonymous, yeah. you know, and yeah. Right. Like, I mean, it might be. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd love them to at, talk about like their use, but also like the what are the barrier, what are the barriers to care you're experiencing, like all the things. What are the patients' complaints here about the program? Like, get their feedback on the pro program. Just patient feedback. Maybe not even like asking them how much cannabis they use. I mean, I'd love to know that, but I ask that to everyone I talk to. But feedback on the program, at the very least. Are you having trouble affording this? Are you having trouble accessing the products that you need? Are you, you know, like. How far do you drive to get to your dispensary? Although hopefully that's going to be rectified soon. That's going to at least decrease for people, but home delivery still could be so helpful for so many. Yeah. And the fact that we'll get, we can talk about this later. I'm not trying to take us on a tangent, but the fact that like, I just got 75 milligram THC ice cream delivered to my door and 50 milligram sodas delivered to my door. And it's like, you begin to wonder, like, was legalizing it the problem? Like, if we can get this other these these same cannabinoids rather uh, delivered right to our door, but not through our state legal system, it's through the right. federal system. You know, it's like, wow. But again, we can get to that later. Um, any other thoughts just on that meeting? I do have something about uh, a thought from the last meeting. I wanted to give you props on, but I wanted to give you more space. Just uh on this meeting while, while it's fresh in our mind, anything that you'd like to recap yeah. or. Um... So, well, yeah, like I think that it's just, so the, the conditions that were voted yes on to approve were um, the pain, the painful ovarian cyst. It's likely going to have that modifier at the beginning. Um, female orgasmic dysfunction, endometriosis. The one that did not pass through is polycystic ovarian syndrome. So that one was um, divided there, um, you know, we'll see pending more research in the future. But if you're someone with PCOS, and this is, we asked that question. So if you're someone that does have polycystic ovarian syndrome with pain, you can qualify under that general painful ovarian cyst designation. So if pain is your symptom with PCOS, you know, get it under just the ov general ovarian cysts and that should be fine. Uh, and then the next, the next, um, meeting we have in June, we are going to be discussing uterine fibroids and generalized anxiety disorder. So that's a big one. Um, right. I think that the generalized anxiety disorder is going to be a quite divisive. Um, and you know, like I was one of the people I was the state actually asked to initiate this petition. Um, or there was a, a uh, someone within the you know, like a couple of years ago, I don't know if it was in a personal or an official context now, but I was asked to supply one of the letters from a provider supporting the use or general anxiety. So like I, um, you know, I, it's one of the most common things people utilize it for. And yes, we know it can increase anxiety in people. So that's what makes it complicated, you know, like at, you know, more therapeutic levels of THC, which that amount is different for everyone. It relieves anxiety go outside of that. And then you may find that you have acute anxiety in the moment or sort of rebound anxiety, like a worsening of anxiety symptoms. But, you know, a lot of times that's just, you know, are you utilizing other cannabinoids like CBD, CBG? Yeah. Are you, are you, do you have an optimized treatment for anxiety? Are you seeking therapy? Are you exercising? You know, it's, it's like, you can't just rely on one thing to fix a complicated problem, which everyone kind of is. It's like, it's just a tool. 
in the toolbox. So, um, you know, I, I hope this goes through. There's a lot of reasons like not to overload, but like we know in the brains of people with anxiety, they have changes in their endocannabinoid system. So they have alterations in the amount of endocannabinoids, the the compounds that are so similar in shape to THC that we produce in our body on demand in response to stress and anxiety, that there's diminished levels or sometimes increased levels because your body is constantly producing, you know, um, to try to compensate, to try to help reduce the stress. The point of the endocannabinoid system is to balance um, and regulate us back in homeostasis. So the other really compelling thing is that we find in the brains of people with anxiety that they have more rece cannabinoid receptors, CB1 receptors. So they have like a higher amount of those that are out there looking to grab cannabinoid molecules. And what the cannabinoid molecules do when they bind to that is calm the brain down. They cut off that fight or flight response. So, um, you know, our own body is trying to use our cannabinoids to do that. So if you get the right combination of cannabinoid, you know, phytocannabinoids, cannabinoids from the plant, you can potentially supplement. If you have a deficiency there, you're not producing enough. You've got all these receptors sticking out there because they're like, we need this. We need more. You give a little bit more in the right dose. It can really reduce anxiety for people. You know, it's, it, there's how much anecdotal evidence, you know, but the, so I think that I want that to see this considered and I know there's going to be a lot of pushback, but there's, there's evidence supporting this, you know, there's evidence supporting that this can be helpful. And when you look at the things that are showing, you know, it's bad for anxiety. A lot of those are like, you know, people that have utilized the emergency room, like an acute kind of cannabinoid overdose where they had a massive panic attack. Like you have to look into what the research really is and who did it to, to see like, what does this picture look like? And I think we need to con consider people as individuals. For some people, cannabis is really helpful. Helps them reduce their use of Xanax. Helps them come off of, you know, Zoloft or Lexapro if that's not working for them or if it's causing a significant side effect interfering with their life, like sexual side effects. That's like one of the biggest complaints. Um, and that, that can make people more depressed when that goes away for them. So uh, that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to say next month at the <laughs> cannabis advisory board meeting when we're debating this. So if, if anybody is interested in adding that or making a comment, or if you utilize cannabis for anxiety, or if you have something to say about it, good or bad, you know, everybody can come, you can register ahead of time to make a public comment. I will share that. You know, I always will pass that information along so that people can sign up to make a public comment in this because that can make a difference. If yeah. you know, we hear from the public, that can really sway some of these people that are on the fence about it. Um, you know, or if somebody has a, a horror story, it might sway them the other way. So, you know, I think it's the more people that chime in here, I think for this one, the better. There's only a handful of states that have generalized anxiety as a condition. So... Yeah. Uh, but yeah. it's honestly the most common thing I see people reported to me using it for. Yeah. And would you agree that maybe some of those concerns that people have, like you say, valid, uh, could be addressed through what is called in the law a bona fide relationship with your healthcare provider? Like, yes. in other words, aren't these things true of every medication we prescribe? I've heard of people like, they yeah. like take a medication and they go on this like work trip and they weren't told that it doesn't like mix well with alcohol and they almost get like fired because they like black out and they have this like bad interaction with the drug. And then, you know, fortunately they're able to explain, you know, Hey, I like some bad interaction with the drug, but maybe some people aren't so fortunate. The point I'm making is like, this isn't unique to cannabis, right? Right. Exactly. It's like, it really is risks and benefits for anything. You you really have to weigh that and just, you know, that bona fide relationship is something that I know a lot of people aren't getting when they, sure. um, when they get, you know, some of the, some of the places that are available to get your card from are like, you should talk to them for five minutes. They don't really care. They ask you a few things to today you're signed gone. Like it's an easy interaction. I see why people do it, whatever. I meet with people for, you know, like minimum 20 minutes usually. And I 
talk to them about like how they're using cannabis. Do they have any questions? If I think of a product that might be helpful for them that's on the market, because I'm always looking at that stuff, talk to them about it. Or I try to like make my pitch for like, grow your own, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, I really believe in that. But, you know, I'm trying to do a little bit more there just because I know people, people might have questions or people might not be, might, ha might have something that they haven't considered about this or, yeah, you know, when, you know, or they might just think about, oh, I didn't know that about like the medical cannabis program. Like I like to make sure people are just taken care of when it comes yeah. to this process. So, you know, I think more, more people, and I, I'm, I'm certainly not like the only one in the state of Illinois that provides like more robust service, but there's only a handful of us. Um, sure. But it's, imp you know, it's important if you aren't having good results, like on your own, if you're like, if you've been using cannabis, but you're feeling like, you know, I'm not getting anything out of this or I'm like using more than I want to and I'm not getting the same effect. Like, that's not a bad reason to talk to somebody. You know, if you've never done it before, if you're trying to use it on your little kid, please come talk to me. Um, you know, or, you know, if you're if you're really old, like, you know, there's a, there's some things you should consider when you start this. So find someone that can help. That bona fide relationship is important, but I don't know. The state doesn't really care about that. I don't know how they would go about my enforcing point, it. You're you're right, but my point is if people need that help and they are concerned that they may or they have a bad experience, that's that's why you know they should keep a relationship with their physician, I guess is my point. And maybe that can just be part of you know the the handouts people give or something like that. I don't know, just right. like hey, it, just like with everything else. I mean, it, it almost feels like it goes without saying when you consider that like you said any other drug this could happen totally and you know just like that like and it's just like anything else too i mean that's how i'm explaining it to people when i'm kind of talking to them about it and if they have a problem or anything like that it's like yes call me back like let's figure this out it could happen with anything though and to be honest like you know i i do this because i prefer this i feel like it's safer than many of the other alternatives for a lot of different things, you know, like I don't give opioid prescriptions. I don't want to do that. Like, that's not something I, I want to manage. I don't want people to have, you know, like if you want to come off the opioids or get a little bit of help feeling better, but without raising your dose, come to me and let's talk about adding cannabis. But, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I, yeah please seek help if you feel like you've got questions. Like Google can sometimes bring some good stuff up, but it can also bring some not great stuff up. And like no hate, there's a lot of um, people that are, you know, customer representatives, like bud tenders there that are are well-informed. But honestly, I feel like a, lo a lot of the ones that I know that have been so good are like leaving the industry for something else. They're not some of these larger companies don't really have an ethos to care for the medical patients as much. Like this is just what I'm hearing. And, you know, like it's, we've seen dwindling services in some of these bigger dispensaries for med patients. So um, you might not have someone at your local dispensary that you feel comfortable even getting a recommendation on if they don't really know the products or if they don't seem to know, you know, much about the medical use if you you know if you're on a lot of medications something else like please call us <laughs> just to check it out there can be drug interactions um you know it's a very common enzyme system that is metabolizing this stuff so if they're competing with other drugs it could mean that you get made way more high than you want or you end up with way more of another one of your medications in your system than you want so you know, not that many drugs are like an interaction that severe, but you got to check your med list if you're on a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely got to be careful. And, um, you know, like I say, I wanted to give you plenty of space on this. I thought it'd be fun to wrap up with the topic of uh, descheduling uh, and I'll sprinkle in some hemp and then yes. we can wrap Um but any other thoughts on the medical cannabis advisory board meeting? Uh, um, no, I, I, I think I rambled on about that a lot, but it was interesting. Cool. It was, um, you know, it'll be interesting next time. So just anybody 
if you want to talk about anxiety and you've got experience, um, think about signing up and making a comment for our next yes. meeting. With and I'll try to time. share that info for people. Thank you for, yeah. by the way, for sharing that info. And I'll try to make sure that folks, if you follow us on social media or subscribe on the memo.com, you get a notification with a link so that you can not only join the zoom call, but also, uh, email to register for public comment. It's important that you do that. They do give space, but just please uh, be better safe than sorry. Register for public comment. And before we moved on, I just wanted to quickly say, this is the props I wanted to give you from the first meeting. Thank you for standing up and asking about uh, possession limits uh, in the first meeting. I thought that was very important that that was like on the record. And while we didn't get an answer from them on that um, yet, I would say, I don't want to, you know, rule out the possibility that we might. Um, yeah, thank you for asking that. I mean, we got the we got an answer from the CROO. We didn't get an answer from medical cannabis, but the CROO answers was they were it was good enough for me. I don't know about you. Did you? Yeah, see? Yeah, I mean, I was like, yes, I saw it, and I thank you. I mean, that was really your question. I'm so glad you went on there, and I was so disappointed. I'm like, come on, like ask this out, out aloud to everybody, but I think maybe they were like, we don't know the answer to this right now. Um, who knows? And it was but quickly. It, you know, I, I felt like it was a, okay, good response. Good. Yeah. Well, and know, it was quickly put, I don't think people meant to, but I felt the question was quickly put down. And I, the reason I told you to thank you for standing up for it is because people were like, oh no, you don't got to worry about, uh, you know, the state possession limit or your home grow. And they were saying you don't have to throw out, you know, if you have more from the dispensary than your possession limit allows. And that's actually not true. The only thing that you don't have a limit on is home grow. Your yeah. limits still, I thought that was kind of funny, honestly, your limits still apply to store-bought cannabis. So you cannot exceed your two and a half ounce possession limit, even though technically everybody could buy five ounces a month, Personally, I have a higher possession limit, so I can buy much more than that. But it, it is pretty funny that whatever is listed on your card, that is your limit for store-bought cannabis. But home yes. grow, no limit. And I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. I liked that answer. It was just, yeah. It. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that I never knew that we had two possession limits as a medical cannabis patient. I have my possession limit. And then yeah. I have, if I grow at home, I, I just must make sure that all of those amounts remain secured in the house. <laughs> well, I didn't know that either. And I was thinking about like that as a purchase limit, not like possession. So like if I bought my two and a half ounces and then I like decided I'm going to go buy my other two and a half ounces, but they're saying you can have two and a half ounces at a time. Mm -hmm. So then even though my allotment is five ounces a month right, and you know, or say I don't use it or I have it sitting around or I want to stock up on something that I need that doesn't come in very often, whatever that that's ridiculous. You know, I thought I totally thought it was a purchase limit, not a possession limit. So like that's important for me to add to tell my patients. I would like to like kind of type up some summary of like these important laws when it comes to their rights as a patient so that they have it. And I don't you know that they, that's not anywhere easy to find on a state website i agree and i'm actually creating one right now um i'd be happy to provide you with the information or whatever um i can give you a peek at it um but anyways uh yeah uh i agree um and that's why i've been working with the state you know to add gifting it didn't they i don't know i haven't asked yet i'm still working with them on the homegrown possession limit thing i had another um, question that that I will post their answer on when I get it in the future, but but yeah, um, I'll just give you a peek at this FAQ that I'm creating because I think it's good. It starts off with, um, you know, who's eligible to per purchase cannabis? Where can you purchase cannabis? How much can you possess? Can you grow your own? Awesome. Can you consume in public? This is actually a really awesome answer. This is the why I really wanted to show you this. The short answer to can I consume in public is no, um, but this is what a lawyer told me. So there is a prohibition on on public consumption. However, we do not know how this is in, will be enforced prior to this bill passing. A lot of different jurisdictions created ordinance violations for cannabis use in public. So we assume 
if jurisdictions will enforce public consumption at all, it will be similar to getting a traffic ticket. There is not a specific penalty within the legalization statute that sets a penalty for public consumption. To be clear, the statute does, does prohibit it, but it does not give a repercussion specifically on what that activity is. I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. So basically, it's just like if your township has laws on the books that you can't smoke weed in public, they'll get you. Um, but if they don't, then right. it's not that you're allowed to, but they also don't have any like per- there's prescribed. No punishment. Like, yeah, there's no, no punishment. Enforcement. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, don't do it. Just right. <laughs> put it out, kids. Which it's right. like how many? Uh, well, I wonder how many towns have enacted something like that so far. Yeah. Um, yeah, but anyways, I'll put that article about pos- possession in the the. Uh, if if you have it, like, could I link it on our resources page to that when you're done absolutely. with it, or you have it up? Oh, that oh yeah, awesome. absolutely. But yeah, like like you said earlier, they did say um, it, it, medical patients do have a possession limit at home, although it depends on the source, as yeah. stated above. Purchased cannabis must be under two and a half ounces, or approved amount. So if you have you know a higher amount, you can have that amount at home. But grown cannabis just must remain secured. So interesting. Well, that's I mean, that's important to know, and that's a you know another reason why I think like they need to create a different website. They need to create something. Maybe if they could get that single agency dealing with cannabis. It would be a lot easier to have yeah. all the rules and all the laws and everything in one place. Like, so what yeah. you just did was incredibly helpful because you know you're not finding that info when you're searching for it on a state website. There is the CROO FAQ, which I will be like taking some answers from. Um, so I got to give credit where credit is due, but it doesn't have. It's not going to be as expansive as mine, you know. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Uh, at least on the issues that re- truly matter uh, from my perspective but um i just have to quickly address your comment and then we can we can start to close with our uh with our thing i don't know it's been a long time since i've heard since i've thought about agency um but i just will say for the record that i don't know how i feel about agency i also don't know how i feel about commission but one thing that i like about commission and i feel weird because it's like in a weird way i'm agreeing with people that have (laughs) put out commission as a proposal in the past which includes cbai but also includes danielle perry former CROO. um the element that i like about commissions is that there are public meetings and if you look at massachusetts they're streamed live on the internet i'm sorry but we don't have anything like that with cannabis regulations in illinois and as a result everything's moving in the shadows now would a commission be perfect would it be filled with stooges uh no and maybe Um, but, uh, (laughs) I would rather, I almost just putting it out there. I, it sounds like commission would be better in the, in the sense that it's public, like kind of an advisory board meeting where, yeah, the meeting is public. Uh, the notes are public and oftentimes it's recorded versus an agency, which, you know, you can FOIA, I guess, but that's hard as I've learned. (laughs) So I agree with you that the transparency part of the commission is very attractive. I mean, that's I, the only that's the only part that sounds really good. And I'm like, yeah, but it's like I just they need to do something soon to just right. coordinate this stuff because it, it it's the delays that happen and the disconnect, I think, is is slowing a lot of things down that we could be getting done faster. Yeah. Okay, well, here we'll we'll wrap up with, and I'm just curious. I'm gonna make I'm gonna bounce around here to make a few points, and and I, I'm curious to see. I'm sure you're gonna see the point I'm making. So first of all, a little bit of history: CBD and T, uh, THC and Delta Eight uh, were all first synthesized by Roger Adams in 1940. Roger Adams. Oh, there's a Roger Adams building in Champaign, Illinois, at the University of Illinois. He's a big time, he's recognized, you know, for his chemistry and scientific discoveries. And uh, just got to say, THC and CBD were first uh, identified in a lab in Illinois. Give Illinois credit where credit is due. Um, I did not know that. And I, I learned that through my 
uh, series uh, uh, for Hash Wednesday, which is a very University of Illinois centric series. If people want to check it out, it's at colmemo.com slash history. Now, the reason I bring that up is because I know there's a lot of talk about synthesis. I personally not into synthesized products, uh, but I just want to say that since we talked about descheduling earlier, I've got the farm bill of 2018 up. And I think this is so cool. This little part right here is what descheduled parts of the cannabis plant. And that's how easy it is. I'm 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 trying to show people like that's how yeah. easy descheduling is. Now, of obviously it created this hemp thing, which is totally arbitrary. And, you know, I've talked about it at length on the show and I'm maybe you agree, maybe not, but um, no, I, I do agree. <laughs> I, I was going to say it can be a divisive issue, but the fact that this is so as easy as this is like, look at this huge bill. This is all like farm shit. Like I could scroll so long. I'm not going to, but this little part, that's all it took to deschedule parts of the cannabis plant. And I guess what I'm asking, and this is the alluring part of hemp for me. It's like, it's like we did, we descheduled this much of the plant. It's like, if we just move the bar <laughs> to the rest right. of the plant, it'd be great. It's like problem solved. Right. Well, I mean, I, I agree. I feel like this is not going to be helpful. We want to make sure there's, you know, safety in sure. the products that people are making. Totally. Right. Obviously we want that, you know, and like it, but none of this is, is based in science really like, you know, uh, and what's going on right now in Illinois around, you know, this issue is, it's about money. It's not about anything else. Um, I, I felt like, you know, scare tactics around different cannabinoids is just more propaganda. Like, let's just be real about this stuff. And so yeah. I agree if it's that easy to do, um, you know, I mean, I don't have any faith that like that Biden would come through and like deschedule cannabis. <laughs> um, like, <laughs> I almost want to show him this though. It's like, you see, if you just do this, like, it's really Maybe short. It's just, it just all, it's all you have to do. Just delete. Yeah. And that it is so crazy. I mean, it's the same thing with this, um, now house or the Senate bill, um, which, what is it? I don't even want to say the wrong number. Um, the Senate bill that's coming up to change it so that pe people can shop at all dispensaries or yeah. medical patients can shop at all dispensaries. These new social equity dispensaries, everything that's opening near your house, you can use your medical card there. No more 55 dispensaries in the entire state that people have to you know, travel far to. So if this passes, it's Senate bill... Ta -ta. 3941. So once that comes up for like a witness slip situation, I'm going to be trying to get as many people as possible to fill out one of those. So if, if you're a medical patient who wants to be able to use your med card at any dispensary you want, which I think is all of us, um, those witness slips, which take two seconds to fill out um, on the internet, supporting the bill, it they it does make a difference. They look at what people are saying. So yeah, they pull uh, them up and tally them. In fact, during uh, the hearings. So seriously, folks, it it makes a difference. Um, right, easiest way to support it. Easy, you know, like it even better to call your senator if you're someone that's willing to do that, and you know, let them know that that you support this bill and that you're a medical patient. But the witness slip's important, and we'll post yeah. that info too. I'm sure everybody. Once that comes up, we'll be sharing that around social media. Yeah, I hope I that I, I, this is an open question. I don't even know. Um, I'll have to look at the bill. I wonder if uh, medical patients will also still get priority at those dispensaries. Yeah, that should be that's kind of an interesting thing to say, too, because. Ugh, um, that's not in there. I know that um, mm. they had negotiated to make sure that at least I think I have to go look, I have to look at the actual text of the bill that th this bill, this bill also adds curbside and drive through available for mm -hmm. everyone with priority for medical patients. There's supposed to be some language saying that medical patients who need to utilize curbside have, you know, special spots or they, whatever are prioritized in some way, but you know, for the people coming in who are used to at least having like the medical line or a medical area, 
um, it might be worthwhile to, you know, talk to the sponsor, talk to the advocacy groups. Like Modern Compassionate Care is part of ACE, the Alliance for Cannabis Equity, which includes Cannabis Equity Illinois Coalition, Chicago Normal, tons of other organizations. So we're trying to advocate together for this bill. So I will mention that because it would be nice to kind of ensure that medical patients wouldn't have to be, I don't know. It's not like there's so many long lines nowadays. Uh, but I mean, dude, I would have missed a podcast yeah. the other day if it had not been for my medical card. I went and really? yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, it was a crazy line. Yeah. And I know that's a stupid anecdotal, like, and obviously like that's, that but I'm just saying, like, I jumped a pretty big fucking line just because of my medical card. I mean, okay. Like, I guess that's totally, I, I always use curbsides. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. You know, right now it's only for medical patients. So I feel you on that. I mean, I guess yeah. I don't, I don't really know personally what the lines look like in there, but yeah. it can be a lot. It actually can have a waiting. And it's like, what if, you know, if you're a senior citizen, if you have mm -hmm. a hard time standing, like um, that's going to be harder on some people. Yeah. And they're not lounges, like they're fucking lines, you know? Yeah. So totally. uh, like, there's no seats, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, right. Right. Yeah. It's like, you're just standing there in like one of the lines they pointed yeah. to, but, you know, having that, that might be like, Hey, if you're going to serve medical patients, you know, I wish that there would be some like required training, even like created by the state about how to work with medical patients, something like that, that they would give, give to people, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah, have some of these things like medical patients have their own area or their own line because especially if they're up there and people are talking about their personal health conditions there, you know, there is some kind of like HIPAA, like a, I've had to sign, you know, HIPAA viol or HIPAA releases right. in the dispensaries as a medical patient. So like, you know, that having a little aside where the medical patients go, where they can kind of have a little privacy to talk, that might be important. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. So anyways, uh, I bounced all around. Um, I was just trying to make the point that, you know, I, I think that like you said, and closed with on the topic of hemp, I think that we definitely need product safety and truth and advertising and, you know, not copyright infringement. Cause of course that's the main example that a lot of people use. These are like copyright infringed products that wouldn't exist in a licensed market. Um, but like the um, sour patch kids and stuff. Yeah. Right. Like you yeah. would not find that in a lot. If you allow these people to operate above board um but anyways um you know i think all those things are not good obviously you know and um but like i say i i think the main thing that we've realized is that the war on drugs is a failure so if, if you're concerned if you do have concern about these products you should welcome them being regulated so that you can right. um base your assertions on more data <laughs> exactly know? and that's the problem it's like they don't they didn't want to have that regulation you know the the motives became so clear it was first that they wanted to ban delta 8 other intoxicating cannabinoids the truth is there's big areas of the state where like the delta 8 is like there's no ability for people to even get to a dispensary you know or they might they might not have a car they might you know the delta 8 is widely available it can be <laughs> shipped to you mm -hmm. um or some of these other you know cannabinoids that, that have have been synthesized the problem is you just need to make sure it's a clean product look at the lab report you know like we need regulation to make sure that the the product is a clean product it just needs right. more testing um, I don't want to see this taken away as a, it's less expensive. Um, and some people tolerate Delta 8 better than they do Delta 9, to be honest. I have some patients have said the Delta 8 is just right for me. Yeah, Delta 9 gummy is too strong. It, it's, you know, I think that um, taking that option away from people just to funnel them into dispensary only. Um, and, you know, the this legislation is, is, created and backed by kind of this little partnership it feels like between you know the state and the businesses the cannabis businesses the cannabis mm -hmm. business association of illinois you know who represents the dispensaries to try to capture that market and as you know you i know you've talked about it and you've had yeah. such great podcasts but it's like this to me is you know from my perspective as a medical provider 
wait a minute, we, yes, we need to talk about regulating, you know, you're going to find more unregulated products now in the black market. If this stuff's not going away, that's the other thing. It's not going away. So right. if you, if you ban it, you're going to be criminalizing more people. You're going to have more unregulated products on the street for people. And you're, you know, it's, people are going to be forced to go to the dispensary, which we know has giant markups in this state on every product. So the price is going to go up because one reason that Delta 8 is attractive to people is it's also less expensive to purchase than what's in the dispensary. We haven't gotten the pricing right there. You know, the pricing is too high in the dispensaries for, for the average person, especially in this economy to afford um, what they need many of the time. So I just feel like the, this is a step backwards. It's going to criminalize people. It's going to take an option for medication away from a lot of people. It's going to negatively impact some of these businesses that are offering this or doing, making really good products, making nice products that people like that are helping people. Yeah. You know, there's a specific like product on the market, the, the ice cream that everyone loves that is totally helpful for patients that have, you know, older swallowing issues that you can, you know, even little kids will be able to eat that if you need to medicate your child with, you know, who has a serious uh, condition going on. That's a really cool product. Um, I'd hate to see that go off the market for people. Right. Well, so well said. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's yeah, all yeah, that's it is. Jane and Mary's is, is the one yeah. I'm shouting out. Yeah, um, that's, exactly. That's a great product, you know, like, um, well, and it's so, interesting to your yeah. point, you know, when you peel off the, I would say almost red herring of, uh, public safety issues. Um, I think everybody agrees these tested should be labeled and not sold to minors without the consent of their parents. Um, you know, like, uh, I, I think that that's agreeable. What's funny when you peel that away, what it really becomes is, you know, I'll quote somebody that said it themselves, like these places will describe themselves as dispensaries, except without the taxes. And they're, you know, these places that are easy to open up shop. And this guy had to put his blood, sweat and tears and pay all these licensing fees and all these burdensome taxes and everything else. And it's like, you're making the case for hemp right now. Yeah. And it actually, one of the press members of the press, uh, it took me a while to understand what they meant by this, but they asked, so was the problem legalizing it? And it again, took me a minute to understand what they meant by that. But what I think they meant by that was like, okay, so these are these products, a lot of these, you know, that have popped up are legal federally. Um, and you're complaining about the burdens of the state regulated market. Like, why don't you like fucking address that then? Right. <laughs> you know, why are you criminalizing these people that are, have nothing to do with you? They're not under your program. They don't want to be right. in your program. Right. Or, you know, they tried and it's like, nope, only certain people are getting these right. licenses. True. Fair enough. Some you people know, did say, yeah. I so. mean, that's right. And I mean, then it's also like, listen to what they're saying. It's like all of these licensing fees, like, hey, state of Illinois, why are you trying to milk this for all it's worth and make it so expensive to do business? And you're taxing every level of everything. And you have all these fees for people, you know, and the new dispensaries that are opening up, you know, those people should have been opening those shops years ago. They were held up in right. stupid lawsuits. And, you know, like that, that topic has been said to death too, but it's like, you know, they're, why are you making it so expensive to do well, this? They're like doubling down on the system that fucked them. And it's like, you should be suing yeah. the state of Illinois. Right. <laughs> they really, I mean, I, <laughs> I feel like so many times people have said like, <laughs> You know, I was um, when I was at ISU speaking the other week, that's, um, you know, uh, I was talking about, you know, these the, the issue of the dispensaries. And uh, Jackie was like, why aren't the patients suing the state for limiting the the, the amount of dispensaries? And that's it's like, OK, well, now the legislation has been introduced. But if that <laughs> doesn't pass through, that should be. And I'm like, I, I guess I hadn't thought about it. Like patients should be suing the state for that. What? They're they're the ones getting screwed there. It's all right. the same products. Come exactly. On. And that's provable when you yeah. go to these dual use stores. I've asked them, like, I can pick anything off of any menu. And they're like, yes, Cole, you can pick any. You can if you find anything on the adult use menu that's not on our med menu, have yeah. at it, Cole. 
it, even right. the craft products. It took them a while to figure that out. But if you go to a me- if you go to a medical dispensary that has adult use and medical, and they carry craft, you can buy yeah. craft at the medical cannabis tax rate. But you know uh, that can't be said at you know these adult use dispensaries. Of course, that's the problem you're trying to address. So totally. That we're and then I mean, it's for these businesses that are just now getting off on their feet. Being able to open up and serve the medical patients that are in their neighborhood, their local clientele, right? that's a win for kind of everybody, except for the people with the medical licenses who are just trying to hold this, you know, limited license framework when now we've created a system where medical patients have the least access in the state. Right. Well, and I've gone to just for to prove your point really quickly, I've gone to like a city like Champaign and they have two medical dispensaries and like three or four adult use dispensaries. I'm not going to go to the adult use ones. Why the fuck would I? I'm going to go to the two medical dispensaries because I'm not going to they have all the same things and I'm not going to pay as much. You know what I mean? So. Right. Why right, would I totally. go to the adult use ones? <laughs> and when the taxes here are 30% plus, it's a huge difference. It might be a difference between I can afford it and I can't. Yeah. Um, and you know, and it's and it's sad too because what's I've had patients have issues where it's like they're looking for one thing. And I mean, this is like sometimes it's like a pediatric patient where it's just like we need this particular mm-hmm. product, an RSO. Um, on the, it's on, it's only available in the nearest, like hundred miles for this family at an adult use dispensary. They don't have it at any of the medical dispensaries. So like they're and and they, when they get it, when they find the, this particular RSO, they go buy as much as they can because their child is using the specific product. So they're going to, because they know that they can't necessarily get this again. And there's been, you know, shortages of what they need. They're going to go pay close to 40% more because it's a concentrate right. to get this product, which is medicine for their child. So, um, you know, that would end with this passage of this new bill, which is why it's so important. Like, you know, I've seen that situation happen more than I want to. And it's like, these are families that really need the, you know, total support from us. And instead we're saying on wild goose chases around the state to find medicine for their kids. You know, there's no way to ship it. There's no way to get it directly to them. They got to drive and get it no matter where it is. So we can do better. Yeah. And I feel, and I feel that, that we might, because of people like you, thank you so much for being, uh, an advocate and being so vocal and not afraid to speak up. And I know, you know, you may have broke decorum once and I know that whatever, (laughs) but thank you, you know, thank you uh, for, for just, because I know where your heart is and I know you didn't mean to, and and I know what you mean to do. And I, I just am thankful that that you exist, Katie. (laughs) So thank you. Yeah. It was so like, Oh, but I appreciate you. I am so glad to be, um, you know, just in connection with you. Cause I love yeah. what you're doing. I hope I wasn't too rambly today, but dude, end of a long, um, not week, but day. <laughs> yeah. Not, no, just, and, a, just uh, a long day. I know. So, um, oh, and I totally forgot to shout out to my, so this summer I'm going to do a special at modern compassionate care for medical cards, 99 bucks, June, July, August. Maybe you need to come get your medical card before you go off to college or, some such thing. I have a college or a high school graduate um, this weekend. So uh, in honor of this summer, come to Modern Compassionate Care and get your medical card renewed for $99. Hell yeah. We'll put the details in the podcast description, folks. And um, yeah, just thank you for your time. And, you know, you always have a, a home here. So if you ever need to come on or have something exciting, like, you know, or any promotions or stuff like that, come on, reach out. Um, and you know, if, if I don't hear from you, you'll hear from me, I guess is what I'm saying. Totally. So. Yeah. Next time we should talk about ketamine. We, I should bring Beth on here, you know, my business partner. If you ever want to talk about the psychedelic assisted therapy, we are down to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to. So. Awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Cool. Cool. Take care, everybody. Thanks everybody. Yep. Bye.